Welcome back. This time we will create representations of the chess pieces, the board, and the entire game state. The classes we wrote last time are finished, so go ahead and close them. Alright, we start by adding a new class called piece type. It will be a public enum, just like player. All classes for this game will be public. Keep that in mind, because I won't mention it every time we add a new one. Okay, a piece can either be a pawn, a bishop, a knight, a rook, a queen, or a king. We will create one class for each type of piece, so to keep things organized, I'll add a folder for them. Inside this folder, we add a class called piece. Note that by default, it is put inside a namespace called chesslogic.pieces. I don't want that, so let's change it to chesslogic, which all the other classes belong to. The piece class should be abstract. That's because it doesn't represent a specific piece. It's just a base class that all concrete pieces will inherit from. Here, we'll add two abstract properties, which all pieces must override. A type and a color, either black or white, represented using our player enum. I'll also add a regular boolean property called has moved. Which we set to false initially. We need has moved because some moves are only legal if a piece has not moved yet. Each piece must also implement a copy method. Soon it will be clear why we need it. Alright, we'll come back to this class in the future part, but for now, we'll leave it as is. Let's add a pawn class next. Again, note that the namespace defaults to chesslogic.pieces. I'll change it to chess logic, make the class public, and inherit from piece. Now we must overwrite the type property. It should return piece type dot pawn. We also need a property for the color of the pawn. To set this property, we'll add a constructor. It takes the color of the pawn, either white or black, and sets the color property.
Next, we implement the copy method. Here we create a new pawn instance with the same color as this pawn. And make sure it has the same has moved value as well. Now we can return the copy. We'll add much more functionality later, but that's it for now. The subclasses for the other pieces are almost identical. Let's add a bishop class next. It must also override the type and color property. The constructor is exactly the same as for pawn, except for the name of course. The copy method is also similar. I trust that you can now create similar classes for the knight, rook, king and queen on your own. Here you can see what they should look like. At this point you should have a class skeleton for each type of piece. Soon we'll make them behave how they should, but for now let's just close these tabs. Next. Let's add a class that represents the board. The board class will store all the active pieces of the game and provide various helper methods. First, Let's add a rectangular array for storing the pieces. It must have 8 rows and 8 columns. That's because a chessboard is 8 by 8. Note that the array is private, so outside code cannot access it directly. Instead, we'll provide access through an indexer, which takes a row and a column. In the getter, we simply return the piece at the given position. Note that this will be null if the position is empty. In the setter, we set the corresponding entry of pieces equal to the given value. Now the board itself can be accessed like a 2D array. It will also be convenient to use a position object as an index. So let's add another indexer for that.
it will just unpack the given position and call the first indexer. Now we can get and set the piece at a given square, either by providing a row and a column, or a position object. All right. Later, we will need to create a board without any pieces on it. The default constructor already does that, so I won't write a custom constructor. Instead, let's add a static method called initial. This method should return a board with all the pieces set up correctly to start the game. First, we create a new empty board. Next, we add all the pieces using a method called add start pieces. We'll write that in a second. After that, we can return the board. Okay, let's write add start pieces. Here you can see which pieces should be where when the game starts. I'll begin by adding the black pieces in the top row. Next, let's add all the white pieces in the bottom row. And finally, we add the pawns for both players using a loop. Great. Now we can use initial to create a board where the pieces are set up correctly for the start of the game. Next, let's add a little helper method called isInside. It takes a position and returns true if and only if that position is inside the board. This method will be convenient for move generation later. I'll also add another helper method called isEmpty. It takes a position and returns true if there is no piece at that position. Now we have a basic representation of the chessboard. Next, we need a class that represents the entire state of the game.
I'll call it game state. This is the class that our UI project will interact with. It should store the current board configuration, which player's turn it is, and a few other things later. For now, Let's just add a simple constructor. It takes two parameters, the player who is next to move and a board. In the body, we store the given player. And the board. Why do we take the player and board as parameters? In chess, white always starts, and we've just seen how the board should look initially. But taking parameters like this makes it easy to test out certain scenarios and make sure they work. Okay, that's all for this part. We now have a bunch of skeleton classes that we can extend to add features to the game. In the next part, we'll work a bit on the UI project and render the board to the screen. See you then.